My topic is big government versus little government. Before I really get into those two definitions, I want to go over what government is in principle or in theory. To quote the beginning of our Constitution, it says, We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves, our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. An odd reference for our founding fathers were that they were 1,700 thugs. They were intellectuals living in the newly formed colonies, answering to a higher power in England. And you know, some people say the Declaration of Independence um, came about because of taxation over without representation, the Boston Tea Party, and other social disturbances that were going on during the time, which is true, but there were other aspects. You know, everyone has their own philosophies, but the premises remain the same. A person in England cannot say what is right and what is wrong in America. It's two different cultures, two different societies. Who are they to tell us how we should rule ourselves? Which brought us to the U.S. government. Now, the government, in theory, is thought of to be as democracy. Webster Dictionary defines democracy as a government in which the supreme power is vested in the people and exercised by them directly or indirectly through a system of representation. It's kind of along the lines of a republic. Like we think back to Rome. Rome was a republic at one point where they had the Senate and the people chose the senators but they did not confer with the senators which is kind of what we have today. We are in theory a democracy but in all actuality, if you look at the, the bailout of Wall Street, Congress and the Senate did not ask the people what they wanted. They acted blindly. And even when they heard after they did the first bailout that the population was unhappy, they went ahead, said, screw the people, and did what they felt was right. When you take the people out of the equation, you are no longer a democracy. But people say republic, democracy, kind of, kind of equal, but there's a big difference. With a republic, the people are silent, which sadly I feel we have become today. But that is aside from big government versus little government. That's just a personal thought. Now, big government. Big government is thought of as a security blanket for the people, the welfare system, the food stamp system, social security, Medicare everything that people say they are entitled to because they are citizens of this nation. The people who side with big government say, we have the resources, we have the means, so why not? If somebody needs help and I'm able to help them, isn't it more compassionate for me as one human being to another to help that person? Which a lot of people will say, yeah, it's true. But on the flip side, you have people saying, well, I know a guy that lives down the street from me. He's on welfare and he's driving an Escalade. It's true. It happens. You have people out in the street panhandling for money, driving a Mercedes. All that has to do with is lack of regulation. And not necessarily regulation, but enforcement of regulation. So even if somebody says they're against big government, they're not against big government because of the philosophy, they're against it because of the abuses and the abuses that happen with it. Now, with small government, it's more of a thought of the governments, the federal government specifically, their power should be limited. And the big deciding issues of gay marriage, if Brandy were here, or teaching evolution and creation in school, or divorce, or anything, it's not the responsibility of the federal government, it's more of a local discrimination. And I don't mean discrimination in a bad way, but it's more of a discretionary topic. You know, what is good in California is not necessarily good for Massachusetts. It's just not. 
And the founding fathers understood that. When they set up the government, they had the different branches. They had the House of Representatives, the Senate, the Congress, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And they had the checks and balances in place to say, if one branch is getting out of line, the other branches can, in essence, shut them up. To say, listen, you're not right. This is what the Constitution says. This is what we should follow. And the Constitution is very plainly written. Very plainly written. There's been amendments to it. Some of the amendments have been ratified, like prohibition. But it's an ever-changing document. The times dictate what is needed for the people. And the forefathers were bright enough to see that. And they were able to add that into the Constitution. You know, it's not just this paper was written in 1776 and it's never going to change. It's always going to be black or white. They made steps to make sure that change could be brought. And if the change is no longer a needed change, it can also be taken away. Now, this brings us to modern day politics where it gets really tricky. Basically, you have Republican and Democrat. The old adage of Republicans were that they were for small government, which is kind of weird because in recent history, President Bush, Bush Jr. Uh, enacted the Patriot Act, which is a huge increase in the size of the government. So how could a conservative Republican justify expanding the role of government in life? And if my little definition sheet here, if you look at conservatism, third line down, you know, it, it has the limited government regulation of business and investing and a strong national defense. The Patriot Act was a way to increase the size of the government, but not doing it in a big government way, but justifying it through national security reasons. It's a big catch-22, but it happened. We're dealing with it now, and it's going to continue until it's repealed, if it's repealed. Who knows? Now, Democrats are supposed to, or generally thought of, being more socialistic which even the definition of socialism has kind of been construed in recent history. You see it all over Fox News. But when the media talks about socialism, they're really talking about communism. And in, even though it's a step in Marx's theory of government evolution, they're completely separate. And, you know, it, it's really upsetting to see people use terms incorrectly, feeding it to the public incorrectly, and not have any repercussions of proper properly educating the masses. But the Democrats are, you know, like I said, they're for bigger government, like the welfare and uh, the food stamps and Medicare, and more recently, socialized medicine. And that in itself has been a big topic. Now, you might say presidential elections, I don't vote for them because they're still following an electoral college. And, you know, I'm a Republican living in the Democratic state, so my vote doesn't matter. Or, you know, I'm an independent living in Texas, and, you know, my vote doesn't matter because they're going to vote Republican and gets a little messy. But it really does affect you because even though whoever you vote for for president, your vote might or might not matter, federal legislation can dictate local legislation. And it's not supposed to. It states clearly in the Constitution that state rights are state rights and federal rights in certain instances should not interfere or coexist because the states are the states. What's good for California is not good for here. And even to hit a more personal note, you know, community politics aside, recent legislation, you know, the, the Patriot Act itself created the Department of Homeland Security, which when I think of Homeland Security, I think of the National Guard because it's their job to protect the borders, the, the CIA and the NSA and the FBI to do all the spying and all the protecting of the borders. You have the Port Authority also. So why do we have Homeland Security doing jobs that were already taken? But if you look at the paperwork, there's little, little snippets and laws little loopholes, little things that are buried in these 1,200-page bills that people don't like to talk about. 
that people need to talk about. The Patriot Act, for example, had a, a wiretapping clause in it, giving the government a right to tap your home computer, tap your home phone, tap your cell phone. Why? In the name of national security. But it says the country's foundation, its foundation is based on liberty and general wel welfare. Seems a little uh, contradictory, just a little. Even moving up to even more recent history, a bill was just passed about two weeks ago called the Defense Authorization Bill. Every year, the Department of Defense puts out a bill saying, this is how much money I need, this is what I need it for, and oh, by the way, I want to be able to do this, this, and this without impunity. In this current version of the bill, there is a little snippet that says the military and federal agencies have full right to take any presumed associate of a terrorist or terrorist organization and detain them indefinitely. To be detained indefinitely, you're losing your, your rights, your right to, right to speech. I can't say what I want to say because somebody might think I'm a terrorist and I'll get arrested. The right to bear arms, Second Amendment, because if the cops come to my house and I have a gun, I'm going to end up dead. Because one, they already think I'm a terrorist, two, I got a gun, there I go. Third Amendment is, you know, has to do with uh, housing soldiers during wartime, so at, at this current state it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, search and seizure, uh, just the Supreme Court threw that out in a Kentucky case a few months ago. That'll be part of my slideshow. And the, uh, the Fifth Amendment, right to trial, you know, innocent before proven guilty. Thrown away. The government can pick you up in your house, take you, imprison you without trial, without warrant, nothing. They don't have to give a reason. They don't have to let you go. That seems like a huge loss of liberties in this country. So it does directly affect every one of us on every level of our life. It really does. But what's the solution? I mean, you got big government, help everybody, but at whose expense? I don't want my tax dollars going to it. Or you have small government. Let the states decide, let me do what I want to do, but in turn that might let the corporations do what they want to do. So, you know, it, it's a lose-lose situation. So it, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around how can there be a solution. If you look at the very bottom of the paper I gave you, there is a word, eclectic. It is by far my favorite word in the whole universe, the whole English language. Everything can be solved and reasoned and whole truths found if you take an eclectic approach. Creationism and Darwinism can be explained to coexist in an eclectic approach. Same with gay marriage. I wish you were here. If you take an eclectic approach, you can see what works, what doesn't work on both sides of the issue how you can fix it, how you can make them coexist with each other and have it work properly, openly, the way it should. But that'll take another hour. I don't want to get into any of that today. But what I want to leave you with is just the thought. You can have your cake and eat it too. It is possible. Thank you. Welcome back to part two of my presentation on big government versus little government. The other day I went and spoke a little bit about what big government is, what little 
government is. I'm going to be reiterating those today. And moreover, I'm going to be going into depth of what I feel the better solution is. That you could take the good aspects of big government and the good aspects of little government and merge them together and make a little purple baby. That's my idea. That's what I'm going to show here today. Nice little cute little picture here. Big guy, little guy. Now people who take judo could say the little guy could win. Some people who just flat out wrestle say the little guy has no chance. But it's not that easy. It's not a one-sided fight. Everyone has their good side. Everyone has their bad side. So pretty much when I talk about big government, I mean more the Democratic Party. Uh, what the Democratic Party believes, their social programs, welfare, food stamps, they feel that we as a nation are responsible to help those who need help. And in order to help those, you need higher taxes. Because in order to have those programs, you need revenue to support those programs. Simple concept. And then another thing they differ on is their aspect of foreign relations and military um, in general military practices. Big government is more diplomatic. They like lower budgets for Department of Defense. They're less likely to jump into a war. They say words are better than bullets. Now, you get little government in here talking about big government and social programs. What do they think? They think if someone's on welfare, they're going to stay on welfare. So why should I help this person out if I'm just going to breed lazy people? Some people would say that's a valid argument, but we'll get into that. As far as taxes, uh, small government, no, 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 don't touch their taxes. They want low taxes. They want low corporate taxes, low personal taxes. Taxes are bad. Oh, it just disappeared on me. Okay. And like I said, words are wind, only bullets win wars. That's what little government thinks, a strong national defense. But who is little? Who's little government? Those are the Republicans. Now, Republicans are supposed to be for little government, though, you know, it's a little murky nowadays, but that's neither here nor there. They want less regulation for a free market. They say if you regulate the free market, it cannot grow. So let the market do what the market does. As far as taxes, like I mentioned in the previous slide, they're not for big taxes. They say the lower the taxes are, the more money people will have and the more they'll spend. So low taxes promotes economic growth. And then military, like I said before, the bigger the better. Now big government, when responding back to little government, a free market without regulation will be a corrupted market. You'll have workers working in unsafe conditions. You'll have profit margins being pushed to the front and even humanitarian issues pushed aside. You look at the factory workers in China. If you let a free market go unchecked, that's what you're going to end up with. You're going to end up with multi-million dollar CEOs and workers only getting paid three dollars a day in, in incredible conditions. And then with the low taxes, if you don't have low taxes, well if you have low taxes like low government wants, you're going to end up in debt because the government still has bills to pay and you have to have the revenue coming in to make up for the expenditure you're going out. So they say, you know, low taxes, it's a nice idea, but you're going to end up in debt. And once you create that cycle of debt, you'll never get out of it. And then back to the national security. Shoot first, ask questions later is a bad policy, according to them. So how do you take two such polar extremes and merge them together? You get a little baby. I love this slide. If you think the problems we create are bad, just wait until you see our solutions. <laughs> Even better. So I chose purple for the baby, my little liberalistic, socialistic type of uh, theoretical form of government. Baby doesn't have a name, so feel free to add one to it. But it's half blue, half red. Mix blue and red, get purple. Seem to make sense. So, what's on the wish list for little baby purple? A free market full of regulation and oversight. You can have a free market, but you have to keep companies in check. You cannot let it go rain free because you will get housing bubbles, you will get technology bubbles like we did with Silicon Valley. Bubbles happen, it's a part of history, we see it, we have to prevent it. It's a fact, it happens, we know it happens. So for us to let it continue to happen would just be kind of unfathomable. Social services for all that need it. 
If somebody cannot find work, who am I to tell them they can't feed their kids? Shame on me for being the person who says you cannot feed your kids because I cannot help you. But I understand people have concerns that it does breed laziness. So with the free market and with the social services, you have to have oversight. You have to keep people in check. You have to have openness. If somebody is buying heroin with their welfare money, don't take away the money, get them help. You know, there are solutions. You treat the problem, you don't punish the offender. It's two different philosophies, and we really, as a society, have to change our philosophy to helping people and not punishing people. Okay, as far as national security, you can have a strong hand military with a strong sense of diplomacy. If you have strong diplomacy and a weak military, a government, foreign government is going to laugh at you. Yeah, you can talk all you want, but what are you going to do, shoot at us with BB, with BB guns? No. You have to have the backing of your words. You can't have empty words. You got to walk the walk and you got to talk the talk. Personal liberties for all. I did not talk about personal liberties in the previous slides because neither big government or little government give a crap about personal liberties. They both claim to, but in all actuality, when you look at the facts, big government, who is the liberal side of the coin, are for personal liberties only through legislation. You cannot be free if you were ruled against. It's kind of a weird philosophy with liberty. If I'm putting rules on you, you're not free. You're free within my limits. And the same thing with the little government. Little government says, I will not impose on your personal liberties because those are your personal liberties. But they come back with military-based doctrine saying, you're free, but I can take you if I want to in the name of national security. Freedom with limitation is not freedom, period. I also would like to include universal health care for all and zero income tax. This is where it gets really murky. You take away the income tax, you're taking away the federal government's revenue. How can you add universal health care, which is a multi-trillion dollar expense, if you're taking away all sources of revenue? There's a solution. You're going to have to bear with me on this one. Martin Luther King. He had a dream of civil liberties. I have a dream that coincides with Star Trek. I have a dream where no one has to worry about food. They don't have to worry about being hungry. They don't have to worry about sleeping on the streets. You know, they, they don't have to worry about basic necessities for life that we take for granted in this country. If I'm sick, I can go to the hospital because I have health insurance. A lot of people don't. I can go home and take a nap. I have a bed. A lot of people don't. I have a fridge full of food. There are a lot of people that don't. In order for us to go out in the world and say we are the best, we have to do what is best at home before we can dictate to other countries and other entities. You know, it, it's kind of hard to say you need to do this when you don't have your own stuff in check. It's, it doesn't work. People see it as hypocrisy. So, let's talk about the meat and potatoes of all this. Money. It's a good dream, but it has to have money. This little table here is tax receipts. In the year 2010, the IRS collected $2.162 trillion in revenue, most of which came. Now, don't, don't get confused here. You have individual income, which is your personal income tax, and then you have Social Security. We're paying both. Just because it has two titles, it's still coming out of our pocket. So 66 to 70 percent of all revenue is coming directly from us, and this little sliver here is coming from corporations. Now I have another table here. I'm going to have to tab out, but I couldn't get it on a slide, but gosh darn it, I wanted you guys to see this, because this blew my mind when I saw it. You know, people would say, yes, there are more people in the country than there are companies in the country. So, of course, there's going to be more revenue from, from them. But it is not as easy as it seems. Or so simple, I should say. And these figures are coming straight from the IRS. So, if there's any fudging of the numbers, the government's fudging the numbers, not me. 
So here, this is once again 2010, total revenue, $2.3 trillion estimated. Now this is gross collections. When you do your taxes, you get a refund too. Same thing with corporations. When corporations do their taxes, they could potentially get refunds too, depending on how much they donate. You know, the tax system itself is very quirky. But that's a whole other subject within itself. But just pay notice to this. This number right here, 9.6. And then this number here, 43.4. This was the percent of collections that the government withheld. The money they kept. So already here we have people doing close to 10 times as much paying out. And they only get less than half of what they pay out back. Whereas the corporations, they only withhold 9.6%. So 90% of everything the corporations are putting into the revenue are getting tossed right back to them. It doesn't seem fair. Let me move on. We'll get back to this here. Do do do. Ah, spending, expenditures, $3.4 trillion. This was our budget in 2010. Defense Department, discretionary, Social Security, Medicaid. So this section here, that's already social services, welfare, food stamps, um, Pell grants with the education system. Department of Defense, we got a war going on. Wars are expensive. History knows war is expensive. And funny, the war we're fighting right now in Afghanistan, the last people to fight a war there were the Russians. Anyone know what happened to Russia after they fought the Afghanistan people? They went bankrupt. And they're in their current state now. And they're doing the same thing to us. And we're letting it happen. We're letting them extend the war, bankrupt the country, and we're going to be in the same position. It's just a matter of time. You know, it, it's... If it hadn't happened in history so many times, you know, it would be a possibility, but because it has continuously happened, it's an inevitability. You know, there, there's no messing around. Now, let's add, you have the three, $3 trillion expenditures, and I'm talking about adding health care to it. Universal health care. I mean, I walk into a hospital, I get treated, I walk out, I don't have to worry about it. We have the resources, it can be done, but it's expensive. In 2008, $2.3 trillion were spent on medical care. That is a lot of money. That's the whole, uh, pretty much what the IRS got out of income taxes. Right there. Taken up right there. There's a problem with this number, though. This is not what Americans spent on health care. This is what health care costs were. A little play of words here. Now, we get all our medical care through insurance companies. Insurance companies are a betting practice. You're going to give me money, and you're making a bet against yourself. Whether it's car insurance, medical insurance, dental insurance, you're betting against yourself. You're saying, I'm giving you this money and hoping nothing happens to me. But if something happens to me, please, please, please help me out. It's not a guarantee. There is no guarantee in insurance. And this is where the problem comes in. In the current state, medical care is a for-profit entity. You cannot put somebody's life in the same line as profits. Because what you have here is this. In 2008, the insurance companies profited over $3 trillion. When I first started going through these figures, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, they profited $500 million. And I was like, wow, that's kind of low in comparison to the other ones. Because the other, like Aegea, profited $337 billion. That's a thousand times more than Blue Cross Blue Health. And then the more you looked into it, the reason they profited less is because they had a lesser amount of denied claims. So these profits are coming at the cost of life. If somebody in your family has cancer and your insurance company says, we know you've been paying premiums for 20 years, we know we've taken about $100,000 from you, but this is a pre-existing condition before you sign the paper with us, have a good day. Enjoy the last six months of your life. It's unethical. Profits, medicine, and life should not be in the same equation. It should not be. But still, I'm talking about expenditures. And I mentioned no income tax. So how the heck am I going to get? So we had the $2 trillion from before. We're adding another $3 trillion, $5 trillion worth of revenue to pay for all this. It's kind of crazy. 
But there is a way. The only tax should be a sales tax. Period. This thought comes by looking at our nation as a whole. We are a consuming nation. We are not an industrializing nation. We are not a manufacturing nation. We are a consuming nation. We consume more oil than any other country. We buy more Nikes. We buy more DVDs. We go to the movies more. We waste more money than any other country in the world. Which is a good thing. If you have it and you can buy it, buy it. Now, the sales tax, this is a tricky thing. and I'm going to try to be brief and explain how this works. You already have a sales tax on all items, a state sales tax, which is roughly, I think, 6.25% here in Mass, but it varies from state to state. Could be as low as 5, could be as high as 8. It's a state right. That should remain a state right, because that's how they get their funding. What I'm proposing is, I took away your income tax, so I am no longer taking 30% of your pay right off the top. You can keep it. But when you go to buy something, now I'm not talking about food, I'm not talking about lower price clothing. I'm talking about a $200 pair of Nikes, a $50,000 Mercedes, a multi-million dollar house. Added sales tax. Now the sales tax would be split between you and the creator of said object. So the corporations who make the Nikes. Nike would pay half the sales tax up front and the consumer would pay the other half at the time of purchase. What I'm looking at is a total sales tax of between 18 and 24 percent. Now before you blow your minds, you're already paying 6 percent. Another 6 percent is going to be paid for by the corporations. So the other 6 to 10 percent remaining, and you know this is all open to debate, would be optional for you to pay. If you don't want to put your money in the social pot, you don't have to buy the item. It's not a necessity. Necessities like uh, food, water, basic clothing. Now this is where it gets tricky though because shoes are clothing, so why would a $200 pair of Nikes get taxed and not a $25 pair of dollar jeans? I'm talking about sensibility here. You know, there's a difference between a need and a luxury. And $200 Nikes are a luxury. They're not a necessity. It's just based on that premises. But it's not going to be mandated. So if you say, I don't believe in socialized medicine, I don't want my money going into it, well, you get to keep all your money, first off, because there's no income tax. So what you earn, you keep. And if you don't want to put your money in the social pot, don't go buy a multi-million dollar house. It's that simple. Don't go buy a new Mercedes every year. It's that simple. Now, how could sales tax equal multiple trillion dollars of revenue? This is where we go into our good American spending habit. Craziness in itself. 1992, according to the Census Bureau, one quintillion dollars, 321 trillion was spent on retail in 1992. You go over to 19 or 2009, it's doubled. Two and a half quintillion. This is a huge number. If you take 6% of that, you're already well over $12 trillion. In one year, by adding 6% from the consumer alone, not even talking about the corporate taxers, would be enough to pay the federal double or the federal budget twice over. Would you rather pay 6% extra sales tax or have the government steal 30% of your pay off the top? I think it's an easy solution. I really do. Let's keep this ball moving. Now, this is kind of mean to corporations. Because if the corporation's paying half the taxes, what happens if their product doesn't sell? They've already paid up front the taxes. It sucks to be a corporation. That's why you're in business. You're in business to jump into the market and be successful in the market. So if people aren't buying your product, so sad, try another market. Teddy Roosevelt said, we are not attacking the corporations, but in endeavoring to do away with any evil in them. We are not hostile to them. We, merely, we are merely determined that they shall be so handled as to subserve the public good. We draw the line against misconduct, not against wealth. It's 
Speaking of Nike directly, they charge you $200 for that pair of shoes that cost $3 to make in China. Now there could be other incentives to bring corporations back to the U.S. because it, it's not just a problem of revenue and expenditure. We need to get this country back to a producing country. We need to pull the corporations like Intel, General Electric, Nike, Microsoft. We have to pull them back to the country. And the only way to do that would be through legislative means. We wrote the Constitution for Germany and Japan at the end of World War II. And the stipulation in those constitutions were that CEOs could not make 200 times more than their base employee. Japan is really big on this one, and it works great for them. Why would it not work here? We see what works in other countries, we see how universal health care works, and we see the things that don't work with them. Why do we not take that information and apply it to bettering our own society? That's one thing I'm asking. Before I wrap up, I got a little video here. This, this video, it's just a quick two minute video, but I randomly came across this. Uh, it, it's a video of Franklin D. Roosevelt. It's a quick two minute one, but what he says is kind of, it, it was the catalyst that inspired me to even have the thought of what could we do, and if we could do it, how could we achieve it? But it, it happened in 1944, just a few months before he passed in 1945. But listen to what he says. Listen to what he talks about as far as what are rights. And keep in mind, this is at the tail end of World War II. So we were in a big fiscal uh, conundrum already from paying for a war. And, you know, it, it's very, very similar to today's political realm. We have economic woes and, you know, it's, it's all still relevant. In our day, certain economic groups have become accepted as self-evident. A second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom Freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad. The right of every family to a decent home. The right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health. The right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment. The right to a good education. All of these rights spell security. And after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. For unless there is security here at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. Even though we are no longer the highest academically achieved nation, we are still looked up to by the world. If we allow the corruption and the disassociation of ourselves with what's really going on to persist, we're going to fall even further behind. We have to be rational. We are not doing this to, to make our lives better, personally, for today's generation. I'm thinking more progressively, more to the future. And there was something Obama talked about before he went to office, transparency. Obama's idea of transparency 
particularly, particularly for political funding, public funding of political figures. He wanted there to be transparency so everyone can see. So his solution was Goldman Sachs is no longer directly contributing to him. What they do, they go to Delaware. They make a shell company. They launder corporate money into the shell companies. And they use the shell companies to donate to the politicians. How is that legal? How is that transparent? It's not. I should be able to walk down to my city hall, ask how much have I been paid in uh, taxes this year, and what was my tax money spent on? Did you guys build a new park this year? Did you guys fix the roads? It should all be open. There should be no lying or no sneaking around where tax dollars go. Tax dollars are tax dollars, and there should be no hiding any of them. And that brings us to oversight and integrity. You can do all of this, but you have to be vigilant. You have to have the oversight set in place to know whether or not people are abusing the system, whether or not people are ignoring the system. And you have to have the integrity of the people who are in oversight positions to do their job. And you have to hold them responsible too. Checks and balances, just like the way our government is set up, the House, the Senate, the Congress, executive branch, judicial branch, it's all checks and balances. So if it's working for the government, why cannot we have the same oversight? I think it's a no-brainer. And like I said, it's not for us. Because by the time all of this would get enacted, all, all of it would take place, we might not even be on this earth anymore. But it's not about us. It's about our kids. What kind of country are we leaving our kids when we pass on? Are we going to leave them a dump? You guys have all seen that movie, Wally. -E. Is, is that what you want your kids to, to end up with? I don't think so. And I, I don't think the solution is really that drastic of a solution. I think it's a simple solution. It's just people have to be willing to bite the bullet and to make the right decision. And that, that's all it boils down to, stepping out of your comfort zone and doing what is right because it is right. Nothing more. Does anyone have questions? Gripes, complaints, hit me, please. <laughs> no questions from the no. floor? Th did everyone understand, like, the concept of it all? As you far as... You did a very good job of that. Usually, I... It, it, it gets a lot deeper, too, because, I mean, I could have gone into what the income tax is used for and why we have it in the Federal Reserve, but that's a mess but in you, itself. You, yeah, you made things simple and easier to, easy to understand. But, I, I mean, it's, I think it could be done. I, I really do. Like, I'm not thinking of it as a, a hypothetical. It, it's, it can be done. I don't think it's really that hard of an issue. You know, we're, we're a consuming nation, so why don't we take something we know we do switch the system around to make it more beneficial for us. Because if we have $14 trillion of extra revenue, our national debt is gone like that. And then you have all this other extra money. What can you do? You could improve the infrastructure. You could improve the industrialization of this country. Is that a bad thing? You know, most Republicans and most Democrats would say yes, because that's money. I want the money in my pocket. But what good is that money in the pocket going to do when you're dead? Isn't it better to put that money to the future, to the kids? That's just me. I'm sorry. That's a <laughs> extra rant. I apologize. I'm, um, I'm sort of, uh, I can't think of the right word, but just uh, intrigued 